next lecture on our R lab, and we are going to start talking about multivariate visualization. So, pictures often worth a thousand words. You can learn a lot of things from visualizations. Our eyes are actually very well adapted to, like, we are very visual creatures, and our eyes are able to pick out a lot of details that can often be lost in numerical summaries. In fact, uh, there is this. Uh, uh, there's this uh, famous data set called Anscom's Quartet. Uh, quartet. Uh, which I think is even in R. It's, let's see, I think it's called uh, Anscom. No. Yeah, yeah, R has it. So you can play around with this data set yourself. Uh, but there's this data set called Anscom's Quartet. Here is uh, a visualization of that data set. It's actually four data sets. And uh, in these four data sets, you have an X variable and a Y variable. And the numerical summaries for all of these data sets are exactly the same. They have the same regression. So uh, these are things that, by the way, we haven't really talked about that much up to this point. But there's concepts known as a correlation coefficient, standard deviations, means. Uh, there's um, You've seen standard deviations and means. Uh, but there's also correlation coefficient and uh, regression coefficients, such as the slope and intercept parameters. And uh, this basically, the regression coefficients are captured by this blue line. And these numerical summaries of these data sets are all the same. Like the blue line, which represents some sort of best fitting line for the data set, is exactly the same for every data set. And yet you can see visually that each one of these data sets are really different from the others. So... It's because of visualization that we know that these data sets have very different characteristics. It's not because of the numerical summaries. So being able to visualize multivariate data sets is a very valuable skill because visualizations can uh, suggest things about data sets that numerical summaries can't. And in fact, visualizations may be something that we do prior to any sort of mathematical modeling of a data set. So being able to visualize multivariate data, this, by the way, is a, a two-dimensional data because there's an X and a Y variable. So uh, bivariate data in terms of its visualization is basically a solved problem. Like you can make scatter plots all day long and scatter plots will tell you a lot of stuff, right? So uh, bivariate is not too hard, but it's when you go beyond two variables so maybe if like you could have a uh, height and weight that's bivariate but if we add height weight and uh hmm what would be something that we could include i don't know bmi um some other variable or it could also be a categorical variable like maybe sex uh once you start throwing in additional variables or uh then uh visualization of those variables actually becomes more difficult so uh, we're going to explore some techniques for multivariate uh, visualization. There's actually a very good book. Uh, this is a classic book uh, in uh, visualization theory, which is uh, the visual display of quantitative information. This is a very readable book, by the way. Uh, you, this is so, yeah, very readable book. I would recommend that you look into it if you're uh, interested in um uh, in a visualization design, this is one book to look at. So um, uh, we're going to start out uh, by talking about base R plotting. This is the plotting system that comes with R. It's the oldest plotting system in R. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's always available. It's always around. And one thing about that's nice about the base R system is just it's always there. And also you get to take advantage of uh, R's uh, S3 object-oriented programming system when you're using the base R system to, uh, uh, w like, whenever you're using that plot function, uh, it's nice to have that system around um, and, and be familiar with it. Uh, it's kind of finicky, and it doesn't show, like, it shows its age, basically. Um, it's... Uh, it, 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 its interface is not as good as the other two plotting systems that I'm going to be talking about, uh, which are Lattice and ggplot2. I'm only going to talk briefly about Lattice because Lattice, I think Lattice's best days are over. Um, I'm not really, it, 
I don't know. Is it just the nature of the internet to be crazy over ggplot2? I mean, I feel like Lattice probably has something going for it. It had a good design. and uh, It had a good interface design based around formulas, and formulas are really good. Uh, it, But uh, it just seems like ggplot2 does everything Lattice does, but arguably better. ggplot2 is the other plotting system that we're talking about. People learn R just so they can learn ggplot, just so they can use ggplot2. ggplot2 is one of R's most famous and well-regarded packages. So it would be a sin to talk about R without talking about ggplot2 uh, because people absolutely love ggplot2. So we're going to be talking about all three of those plotting systems. Um, but we're going to start out with the base R system. So R's built in, R comes with built-in functionality for plotting. And uh, we can use that. It's, it's nice that the plot function is a generic function. Uh, it will often pick the right plot for the type of object you feed it. So that's... That's, that's generally very nice. It's an automatic plotting function. Like you give it, like I can do uh, plot one through three. It knows what to do. Um, but the fact that, um, the fact that if you can make, you make a density function. So like, so you make an object representing a density estimate. Because this is, because by the way, I've, I've been showing you plot uh, density. Let's plug in a writer set, data set. Let's say rivers. Like it, ma it makes that plot and you didn't really have to tell it much, but actually density estimation is not necessarily uh, tied to plotting. We do density estimates for reasons other than just plotting them because what this function density is doing uh, is it's creating what's known as a density estimate object that gives us information about it, about our density estimate. And furthermore, we could say uh, plot, let's do um lm uh lm uh let's do sepal length uh model by sepal dot width uh data equals iris and it creates these plots that are uh relevant to linear models because the lm function is a function for making linear models statisticians make lots of linear models so it gives us a bunch of, it's not actually applying the data itself, but it's creating what are known as diagnostic plots uh, for, to judge the quality of a linear model. So this, this plot function is kind of this universal function where you feed it some object, like this is what LM, well, let's uh, take all of this up here and delete the plot part. This is what's being created and plot knows what to do with it. So it's kind of nice to have that function around and be working with it. So let's let's start using plot and also some other functions from base R to create some interesting plots. Uh, the first multivariate plot that we're going to talk about is a scatter plot. A scatter plot plots each data point as an ordered x y pair, uh, with x being the value of the variable corresponding to x and uh, y so forth. So basically, you're plotting stuff on a Cartesian plane where each data point gets a point on the Cartesian plane. So one way you could do this is via plot x y. So for the iris data set. Here we can plot the sepal length against the sepal width. Uh, and that will create an XY plot. Now, I mean, this plot is, I mean, it is what it is. At the same time, though, it's a little unfortunate that there's actually three species in this plot. And we can't really distinguish that. We can't really see that. So we probably need to add some more uh, information to this plot. So if we, so we should probably do things like, uh, add color to to the plot so that uh, we can distinguish the different species in the plot uh, or change the character of the points uh, so that uh, points corresponding to different species get different characters. And we can do so with this function call. All right, so look over here. Uh, one species got black, one species got green, and one species got red. And also, one species is being uh, represented with circles, one is being represented with the uh, green crosses, and one with red triangles. So how did we do that? Well, first off, we got this with function because I'm tired of using the dollar sign all the time. 
All right, so sepal length, sepal width, species, these are all variables in the iris data set. Just as a reminder, here is the iris, and here's the first few rows of the iris data set. Okay, so uh, the parameter call is the parameter that controls the color of the species. So I pass to call as dot numeric species because the species variable itself, let's do str iris. The species variable itself is a factor variable. And if we want, what, what this uh, call parameter is expecting is numbers or possibly strings. Uh, we could pass it uh, strings representing colors instead. Like for example, we could pass the string red. Uh, let's, in fact, let's, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, so change this to red and uh, we will plot and then we will run this line. All right, so now everything is red. So you're allowed to give it colors, uh, give it strings. I guess another thing we could possibly do is, uh, well, okay, let's not do that. Uh, there's a ver variety of different ways we could um, tell it what to do for the for coloring species. Unfortunately, though, it's rather painful because we have to give it a color for uh, every data point. So, for example, if we wanted, let's say, um, let, let's say that we wanted uh, the Setosa species to be blue, the Versicolor species to be uh, red, and the Virginica species to be green. We would have to do this. Uh, rep. Uh, we will give it uh, blue, red, green, each equals 50, and then run this line. All right, so it did what I want what I wanted it to do. The reason though, I mean, the reason though this works is because I know that in this data set, each of those species that are occurring consecutively, and there's 50 flowers of each species. So that's the reason why this vector works. So I had to create a vector manually saying what the color of each point is. Because there's 150 points that are being plotted here. And I'm just having each point being... Um, I'm just uh, telling it how specifically to color each point in order. So I knew the order of the species. If you wanted to, this to work in general, you'd have to have a much more general line here. Which is ultimately why I just went with as dot numeric species because, like, I don't really get a lot of control over the colors doing that, but at the very least, it works. PCH is a similar thing. Uh, let's go ahead and um, uh, let's go ahead and call in the manual for uh, plot. So generic X Y plotting. So I think that's what we want. So, okay, it will give us, if we're reading through this, this will give us some more information about how each of these uh, parameters work, although, actually it might not, we might need to go looking at uh, some others, like, uh, let's see, what is actually responsible for the parameter values, according to this, oh, par. For more details about graphical parameter arguments by, uh, used by traditional graphics, see par. So we should see the manual page for par. Okay. So if we go reading through this. Uh, all right. Yeah. Here's some graphical parameters like adjust in and by. See if we can find a uh, call. Yeah, there's call. Uh, so that specifies color and uh, PCH. Uh, all right, PCH is either an integer specifying a symbol or a single character to be used as the de as the default in plotting points. See points for possible values and their interpretation. Uh, uh, yeah, so it, this is something that controls points, and we can change PCH to different numbers to diff get different kinds of characters. Uh, so let's close that out. So for example, I just said as dot numeric species. Uh, if I wanted to, I could say this is going to be the number 21, and that will yield a certain, and that will yield a, a particular character. Uh, so that so that gives us open circles when we set PCH equals to 21. Uh, but if we set it to 20, and then run this, 
that gets us filled in circles. So, uh, yeah, the, this is one of the problems with the base R system. You have to know the exact code. There's basically magic numbers. Uh, magic numbers are a programming term for the number itself isn't all that important. It just, just you need a number for a thing. So to distinguish different options, the you, you need it like, yeah, so... Yeah, you need like different numbers for different options, but the number itself doesn't matter. It's just indicating which option you chose. So, so in the end, in the end it starts looking like magic numbers. And another problem with this is, uh, so let's go back to our original plot. Another problem with this plot is that we don't have a legend. A legend is some indicator, some in, in the graphic, what uh, different encodings mean. So, for example, you got black circles, we got red triangles, green crosses. What all does this mean? And unfortunately, in base R, you have to manually create the legend. So here I created a legend. I say there's three categories, Satosa, Vertical, and Virginica. Their colors correspond with the colors with one through three, and the and the point character corresponds with those with one through three. So if we so now I've created a legend. And and uh, now we can actually read this, but we had to manually create it, and that's kind of a pain. So just uh, for what it's worth, uh, as dot numeric uh, species dollar no iris dollar species like that's what we're ultimately passing in to this function, and it's give, give, giving us the numbers one, two, and three. So that's how we would uh, uh, control it. So yeah, um, that's making a scatter plot with base R. Also, we had to like these these arguments right here are tell are basically where on the plot the legend's going to appear. So for example, I could change this to uh, so let's run this. Uh, let I could change uh, this to let's do let's say two two point one, and it's going to appear somewhere else oh i think so it made it and i don't know where i put it <laughs> so oh i think it's off the screen so that's that's honestly rather annoying so let's change this to five yeah so I put it somewhere else uh so it doesn't automatically create a legend and you have to control you have a lot of control over that legend and these are honestly downsides of the base our plotting system this uh, like all of this stuff that I've been doing right here, it's a huge pain. And other plotting systems like Lattice and ggplot2, uh, the way they handle colors and point characters is more intuitive, and you don't have to manually create a legend like we are here. So that's that's annoying. Now some um, a little bit of a uh, plotting th of graphical theory here. We have we're trying to communicate. Um, we're trying to communicate the length and the width of the different flowers. And we are doing so with X and Y position. That's fine. But we also have a, di we also have basically a third variable, which is the species. And we need to communicate that ver third variable somehow. How we're doing so is via what's known as a double encoding, where we encode the species both via color and point character or the different shape of the points. So our eyes are, fairly well attuned to handling both of those things and just combining those together makes it very clear when two points are two different species and that makes it and that just makes the plot even more readable to have that additional uh, redundancy in how you're representing the species by representing it two different ways color and also character which also makes it better if you were to if you were to say uh, plot make this plot in black and white or even more <laughs> critically this is not a colorblind friendly plot We've got red and green together, and people who, with red green color blindness will have difficulty reading this plot. So that additional color, that additional encoding, uh, makes it more likely that those color blind individuals will read our, will be able to read our plot. They can still read it even though they can't differentiate the red and the green. Although better, what would be better is if we just used a color blind friendly color palette that didn't use red and green like this. Okay. All right, uh, so um, 
So suppose we don't want all the species on the same plot. Uh, for instance, the Versicolor and the Virginica flowers, they're pretty similar to each other, and as a result in this plot, they're overlapping. Now, the fact that they're overlapping is in, its, uh, in and of itself an interesting fact. But we may still want uh, them to be broken up into different plots. So we would like to have a plot for the Satosa flowers, the Versicolor and the flowers, and the Virginica flowers, and we would like to have all those plots adjacent to each other. And we would also like to have them have the same scale so that we can compare the different plots. How are we going to do that? Well, uh, with so uh, both Lattice and ggplot2 have better answers than what we're about to do. But what we're going to do is manually create three different plots. And to do that, we're going to we're going to have to tell the, these plots the range over which we want them to plot because otherwise the plot windows will automatically be chosen to best fit those data sets which those individual subsets of the overall data set. And the disadvantage of that is that you really won't be able to tell, like you'll have to look at the scales to in order to be able to judge the locations of these different data sets, and that's a pain. So we're going to have to get the range of these data sets and make sure that we're using a common range. So what I did is I got uh, two R vectors uh, with range and uh, length range to represent the range of the sepal width of sepal length, because we're going to be manually passing those into our plots to let those plots know about the ranges of the data set over which we want it to plot. We're going to manually tell it what range we want. Then we're going to create, we're going to split up manually the data set into three separate data sets for Versicolor, Satosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. So here, for example, is Iris Satosa. So it's just a, a subset of the overall data set. And then we're going to change some of the our plotting parameters if we're going to do that, the first thing we should do is save our existing parameters. And we do so by saying old par, which is a variable, will be assigned the results of the par function. Here's what par gives us. It tells us our, our uh, plotting parameters, returning a list containing those parameters. Okay, and then we're going to change one of, the per one of our plotting parameters, which is the... Uh, uh, that's going to be the, uh, like, we imagine our plots appearing in a grid. Right now we have a one-by-one one grid where there's only one plot. We're going to change it now so that it's a one-by-three grid. So it, the plots will appear in one throw, in, in one row, and three columns. So you can almost think of this as a plot matrix, or a scatter plot matrix, where each, where you have a matrix of plots, and each plot gets their own uh, part of the matrix. So we're going to set that, and then we're going to create a plot for the Satosa species, a plot for the Virginica species, no, a Versicolor species, and the plot for the Virginica. And because we set this uh, parameter, instead of creating brand new plots each time, it's going to plot these. Uh, it's going to make these plots adjacent to each other. Uh, notice uh, that we're that we're passing a data parameter. Notice that we are representing X and Y position differently. We're using uh, this tilde notation, uh, which which is using the formula interface. And I just find that a more natural way to make these plots. Notice that I am manually setting the Y range to what we found before. Uh, we're doing the same thing for the X range. And then I set the main uh I set the main title of each of these plots because it's making separate plots. Notice that it's uh, recreating the X and Y labels, which is also unfortunate because that's redundant. Um, and after we do this, we should reset our plotting parameters to what they were before by passing in those old plotting parameters to the par function. Uh, it then throws out like a ton of complaints, and I just... I gotta wonder why this is a thing. Why is it? Why is this function like? Why is it returning plotting parameters that it cannot set? Like th this part is something that I just never really understood. Why this is even happening? Why it's throwing out a bunch of warnings because of plotting parameters that it does that it can't set, but it returned it 
when I asked for the old parameters. Like, this is just, it's just weird. But yeah, it's, for for what it's worth, it seems like this is uh, not a great way to make these kinds of plots. And honestly, it isn't, because if you go to Lattice, Lattice is especially attuned, uh, especially made for side-by-side uh, -side plots like these. Like, that's almost its reason for existence. But uh, ggplot2 as well, both of these have better ways of splitting up a plot for different subsets of a data set than what the base R system is doing, where you're basically just making this by hand. Um, all right. So, all right. So there's a, the, the side-by-side -side plots. Uh, suppose that there's a third, let's say, numerical variable, a quantitative variable that we wish to be plotting. So far, our third variable was categorical. It was the species of the flower. But now I want to work with a numerical third variable. One thing we could do is use a bubble plot to visualize the data set. Why would we use... What is a bubble, bubble plot? A bubble plot is a scatter plot where the area of the points changes with that third variable. So that means the third variable is being encoded via, via the aerial uh, or the aerial visual channel uh, you are communicating via area of points not the diameter of the points the area of the points you don't want to you don't want to do the diameter uh, let's go ahead and make such a plot so i'm going to load in the using our library because there's a data set in that library called sat that i want to visualize and what i want to visualize is the uh let, let's see what what, what is this exa exactly? Uh, so we have the average total SAT score uh, modeled against the teacher's salary. Uh, yeah. Uh, average teacher salary. And this, so we're, what we're looking for, uh, okay, let's just look at the data set, SAT. All right, so we have uh, rows for different states. We have average total SAT score, and we also have average teacher salary. Let's do head SAT. Yeah, so we have uh, the average salary of teachers in those states, I think in thousands of dollars. And we also have average total SAT scores. Uh, so over here. Okay. So we're going to plot the SAT to uh, average SAT total as the Y variable and the salary as the X variable. Uh, our data set is SAT. Uh, let's see. I hear it. I'm making... Uh, I'm saying that the color is going to be uh, basically black, but with some transparency. The out so there's this function called RGB for RGB colors, which it where you're viewing colors as a combination of red, green, and blue uh, light channels. And there's an additional parameter called alpha that can control for transparency. I set alpha here to 0 0.25 because I want the circles to be semi-transparent because the idea of the double bubble plot is that you're going to have uh, points of different uh, size overlapping each other. CEX controls the size of these points. Uh, I also set PCH equal to 16 because I want filled in circles, and 16 is filled in circles. <laughs> it just is, all right? Why, why 16? It's a magic number. 16 means filled in circles. Uh, CEX controls the size of the points, and there's a third variable that I want to plot. I have the... Uh, salary in total, but I also have this third variable representing the percent of students who took the SAT. So the area of the circle is going to be uh, proportional to the percentage of students who took uh, to, who took um, the SAT. But CEX, if I remember right, I'm not sure if it's the diameter or the radius, but one way or the other, we don't want to just pass in percent. Because if we pass in percent, then that means that the diameter will be scaling with percent. And that means that the area will be scaling by the square of the percent. We don't want that because the human eye is not going to see the diameter. The human eye is going to see the area. The area is the more dominant channel, which will cause people to misinterpret the data set. All right. So the, this is going to be the resulting plot. Notice that we have little circles over here. That means that we have um, uh, so we have little circles over here, which means that the percentage uh, that the percent of students taking the SAT is small, 
And over here we have uh, a, a large circle, meaning that the percentage of students taking the SAT is uh, high. We also have higher salaries. So salaries are increasing in the X dimension and the SAT total is increasing in the Y dimension. So we're looking in this plot for some patterns. Uh, oh, and here we can see definitely that the circles are semi-transparent because we have two circles that are overlapping. And uh, as a result, since they're semi-transparent, we get more opacity in the overlap. All right, so what should we be interpreting from this plot? Uh, well, for starters, we're seeing a negative relationship between the total, but between SAT total and teacher salary. Uh, but and we're also seeing, um, well, let's see, a positive relationship in total. No, a negative relationship in total and percentage because uh, the circles seem to be larger for smaller totals. And then the question is, what exactly does that mean? Well, uh, here's the thing. In the United States, the SAT, which is a college placement test, uh, there are actually two competing college placement tests in the SAT because these things are uh, privately administered. These are private companies. Uh, I think, uh, isn't SAT College Board? I think they're the ones who create who run the SAT. So it's, uh, I, think, uh, I think in European countries and in Asian countries, these college placement tests are administered by the state. Um, but in the United States, they're private. Uh, they're private exams by private companies. And as a, so the thing is, people actually have a choice in which test they're going to take. They could take the SAT or they could take the ACT. And for some reason, in some states, some tests are preferred to others. Like, for example, Utah, the state of Utah is a state where the ACT is preferred to the SAT. But I think on the East Coast, the SAT is preferred to the ACT. Now, uh, that generally doesn't matter too much um, because colleges can still translate between one test and another. Uh, they can convert an ACT score, which is on a scale from 0 to 36, I think, or is it 32, something like that, to an, SA to an SAT score, which is often in like thousands and hundreds and such. Uh, so it's not a big deal, but the fact is colleges in different states often have their own preference. So East Coast colleges tend to prefer the SAT, and the West Coast colleges, or Western states, I think, prefer the ACT. Why? I really don't know. I think it's just this historical... I think, it, I think it's just purely history. But as a result, when reading this plot, it's possible that what this is basically saying is that if you students are taking the ACT or the SAT, then you are seeing higher scores. And if a lot of students are taking the SAT, you're seeing lower scores. How should you interpret that? Well, uh, it could be the case that the students who are taking the SAT in these states where you're, you're not seeing many students taking the SAT are probably students who are more sensitive to what to what college they're going to. Like they're not just going to default to their local colleges, they're going to or local universities. They're thinking of out-of-state universities, and thus they're probably more driven students. They're probably better students overall, since they're a bit more conscientious about their choices. And as a result, you get higher scores. Whereas if a larger proportion of the of the student populace is taking these tests, you get you're seeing more students, and you have less of this selection effect. And as a result, you see these uh, lower test scores. All right. So interpretations like this, by the way, are very important in visualization. This is a lot of what we're looking for. All right. So this is a way to visualize three variables together. It's an okay method. It's going to have troubles the moment we go into four variables or five variables or ten variables. What are we going to do when the number of variables that we need to visualize gets even higher? One thing we could do is construct what's known as a scatter plot matrix. We have multiple scatter plots in a grid or a matrix, and each show a different combination of variables. So variables become rows and columns of the matrix, and the plot in a particular row and column of the matrix represents a particular combination of these variables. There is an there is a base L fun, base R function called pairs that can create scatter plot matrices. Um, 
So here is the scatterplot matrix for the iris data set where we're plotting uh, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. And we're going to encode the species of the flowers via color. So we end up with this uh, scatterplot matrix. We have uh, right, right here, this is a plot comparing the sepal width to the sepal length. Uh, this plot right here compares the petal length to the sepal length. And this plot right here, the petal width to the sepal length. This plot compares the petal width to the sepal width. So you'll notice that if you go to the opposite side of the plot, uh, of the uh, diagonal, you get a mirror version of the plot. So actually this entire um, section of plots, this uh, uh, so the plots on the subdiagonal of the matrix are actually redundant. And as a result, some people when uh, making scatterplot matrices would rather put some different information down here. Like for example, they'll, instead of having a plot, they might have the correlation coefficient for that combination of variables, but whatever. Um, so we end, so we now get like several different plots that allow us to see more about our data set. The problem with this scatter plot matrix is they can get really big. Like if you have n variables, the number of plots that you're making is on the order of n squared. That gets really big. So this is going to fail for more, for higher order uh, uh, variable for higher order dimension basically as the as your as the dimension of your data set gets really large or the number of variables that you're considering gets really large the more cramped these plots are going to come, become and the harder they are to read so that's an unfortunate thing uh, so another way to visualize multivariate data is with a parallel coordinates plot uh, so the function for creating such plot is par chords, and you can read the lecture notes for more of a description, but this is a video, so I'm just going to show you what it looks like. Here's a parallel coordinates plot. The value of sepal length is going to be along this line. The value of sepal width is going to be a point along this line. A value of petal length is a point along this line, and a value of petal width. And I've, uh, again, enc encoded species via color, and basically a point corresponds to a line along this plot, right? So one point will be one line on the plot. The unfortunate thing about this plot is because of the hard junctions, it's hard to tell sometimes uh, what is one point and what's another because it's like we've got two different points uh, converging here. And now I don't know whether we whether this is the line or whether this is the line it's it's hard to tell now there's actually a way around that where you draw instead of drawing lines with hard corners you draw like these smooth lines connecting points and the smoothness helps you differentiate points but i didn't do that here i'm actually not really sure how to do it in base r or at all <laughs> like i haven't had to make any one of these plots but this is another way for you to possibly see, like, for example, trends. Like, for example, we see, okay, in the Satosa species, it seems like uh, larger, uh, smaller petal lengths are associated with larger petal widths. We see this positive relationship between these. And the opposite situation with between sepal length and petal length. Now, one problem with these plots is that they are somewhat dependent on the order in which you're putting the, the different... Uh, the different variables. So if I were to go back up here and switch out uh, petal length with uh, sepal width. So let's uh, change this to petal length and change this to sepal width. You get a different looking plot. So there is sensitivity to which, and, and uh, there's sensitivity to the order in which you put the variables in the plot. So you need to think about what is the best ordering of uh, of the variables. And more advanced, uh, more advanced visualization systems would probably allow you to allow, like, okay. So for starters, more advanced visualization systems are interactive. This we what we have here is something that we would print out because it's static, it doesn't move. But more advanced visualization systems would move. They would have a whole bunch of buttons and things you could drag around so that 
so that users can play with the visualization and learn as much as they can from them. And in such a system, you could probably have a situation where you could, where a user could click and drag the different variables so that they can try and see in the visualization itself the relationship amongst the ordering of the variables. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that here because that's definitely getting much more complicated. All right. Uh, another thing we could use, another visualization method, is a heat map. A heat map is a matrix where the rows are data points, columns are variables, and in each cell of the matrix, the value of a variable for an observation is represented in color. The hue, or the intensity of the color, depends on the value of the variable. So the function responsible for creating uh, heat maps is heat map. So here I've created a heat map for the variables in the empty cars data set. Okay, so uh, the color intensity is course is uh, related to the value for each of these variables. The unfortunate thing, though, with this heat map is it's all on the same scale, which is inappropriate because cylinder, for example, is a number between like uh, one through eight, but but display but HP is in the thousands, and this function doesn't know that. So cylinder ends up looking really small; and you can't see anything. So what we should really do is scale each of the variables in this data set, creating a new matrix uh, containing the scale data. Uh, and then after that, uh, create a new scatterplot matrix where each, where we've now scaled each uh, column so that it's relative to itself. And now we can actually learn something from this. Uh, for instance, it looks like um, higher horsepower is associated with higher displacement and higher cylinders, but also lower MPG. And uh, we can start picking out relationships like this. Uh, higher MPG is associated with lower cylinders, displacement, and horsepower. And uh, we're looking at uh, different cars along the uh, y-axis. So, so yeah, cars with uh, better miles per gallon have uh, lower horsepower, which is not shocking. Like, anybody who knows cars, I think, would expect that. And that would not be me, by the way. I'm not that great with cars. Um, okay, so uh, so the advantage of the base R plotting system is that all installations of R include it. The disadvantage is, though, is that it's often rather finicky. And honestly, serious data analysts are preferring packages such as Lattice or ggplot2, but especially ggplot2. Uh, so unless there is a convenience function or plot method for whatever plot you want to make, such that it's just super, super simple. It's almost one line to make that plot. You probably should stay away from the base R plotting system if you want to make serious plots for, like, publication. Uh, so um, uh, it's also annoying that legends have to be manually created. So uh, that's going to conclude my discussion of the base R plotting system. In the next lecture video, I'm planning on, on talking about Lattice. Uh, and then after that, we'll talk about ggplot2. All right, so I will see you there.